Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Teresa Marentet, CEO and Chief Nursing Officer of the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit. Please be reminded that public health measures continue to be the most important protection to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Stay home if you are sick, maintain a two meter distance from others, wash your hands often with soap and water, or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, use proper respiratory etiquette by coughing into a tissue or your sleeve, and wear a mask when attending commercial establishments. For area businesses, visit our website to access our Safe Return to Business Toolkit. I will now report our current case counts. There are 111,697 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Canada and 37,942 cases in Ontario. Chatham-Kent has 197 cases and Sarnia-Lambton has reported 292 cases. Michigan now has 74,725 cases, with 12,267 cases being in Detroit. Today, we are reporting 2,044 cases of COVID-19 in our community, an increase of 27 cases from yesterday. Eight are workers in the agri-farm sector, one is a healthcare worker, a local healthcare worker, 14 are in the community, and four are still invest being investigated. 1,314 people have now resolved, 631 people are self-isolating, and 15 people are in the hospital. 27% of our cases are between the ages of 20 and 29 years, and 24% are between the ages of 30 and 39. 64% are male, and 35% are female, with 1% unknown at this time. Our community has lost 69 people to COVID. 49 deaths have occurred among residents in long-term care and retirement homes. There are two long-term care and retirement homes in COVID outbreak. And in addition, there are seven workplaces in the agriculture sector and two workplaces in the manufacturing sector experiencing a COVID-19 outbreak. Symptoms of COVID-19 can range from mild to severe. Some common symptoms include fever, a new or worsening cough, a barking cough, chills, sore throat, and shortness of breath. Call 911 if you have difficulty breathing and are struggling to breathe or speak, or are experiencing severe chest pain if you're feeling confused or losing consciousness. Please be reminded that Windsor-Essex has two COVID assessment and testing centers, Erie Shores Healthcare in Leamington and Windsor Regional Hospital at campus. SOHAC in Windsor also offers testing for First Nations, Métis and Inuit people and their families. To check your results, please go to www.wechu.org and click on view your results to access the online test result portal. If you are unable to view your results, please contact the assessment center or healthcare provider that initiated your test. The health unit will call you if you have been tested positive for COVID-19. Please continue to visit our website at wechu.org for the most current information and case counts. I will now turn it over to Dr. Wajid Ahmed, our Medical Officer of Health, for further updates. Good morning and thank you again for joining us. From the beginning of this pandemic, the Windsor Essex County Health Unit has valued its role in providing evidence-informed information and resources to the community. This initially began in March with our daily live updates to discuss our local situation and answer questions through the media with myself and our CEO, Theresa Manton. We were one of the first health unit who committed to daily media briefing since we announced our first COVID case in our region. Our health unit that, ha that has continued to commit to this type of communication even after four months of this pandemic, and we have continued despite the pressure and considerable workload of our health unit. <clears throat> our team ha also responds to hundreds of questions via phone, email, and social media on a daily basis and our local statistics continue to be updated seven days a week on our website at 9.30 during, this, uh, during the weekdays and 10.30 on the weekends. This information includes total cases to date, number of deaths, resolved cases, current outbreaks, cases by sex, exposure type, status, status of cases, and age. In our daily breakdowns, we report how many cases are in the agri-farm workers, how many are from the community, how many are from the healthcare workers, travel, and we also report those that uh, cases that are still under investigation. <clears throat> 
When cases are reported as under investigation, this can be for many reasons. It may be that we receive the results closer to the 8 p.m. in the evening, and since our COVID team work until 8 p.m., we may not have all the details to report back to the public. These cases under investigations are always included on our website once the information is known. In addition, each Friday, I present a weekly detailed epidemiological summary for our region prepared by our epidemiologists who are also working diligently every day to investigate our cases for the outbreak investigation. And as we have men mentioned before, the number of case rates that we have seen is pretty much similar to the rates in, in Toronto and the amount of work that it entails to create all these epidemiological summary and analysis goes above and beyond what our health unit of our size is providing with the resources that we have available. The weekly summary always break down our data on confirmed COVID-19 cases over the past 30 days overall and over even in the last seven days. This breakdown of information is helpful to give a sense of trends to inform planning for our community. We also break down our cases in the summary by each of the municipality as well. The full summary is posted to our website each week and is available for review from by everyone. Our case counts and statistics webpage had over half a million visits in June alone and our communications department and epidemiologists answers questions daily regarding clarification or for interpretation of our data and information locally. We continue to commit to providing up-to-date information. We do provide comparable uh, information to majority of our health unit colleagues and exceed many. Despite having one of the highest rates of COVID-19 in the province, and despite being one of the lowest funded and uh, resourced health unit uh, on a per capita basis, we still provide all that information with all that level of detail. From a risk communication perspective, it is very important for me and my team to use an evidence-based approach to present facts and not to speculate things that are not true. While we heard that more detailed breakdown of data is needed, we need not to forget that this data impacts individuals and communities. We have the examples right in our region as well as from other, other countries that how un, um, um, uh, how non-evidence-based information can impact a community and uh, result in spread uh, in, the, in the community. Public health is working hard to prevent any and all of the misinformation that is out there and will ensure that facts are presented to the public. More detailed conversation on these data happens with all the mayors, CAOs of every municipality on a regular basis to help them with their overall planning and address any concerns whether it's related to regional reopening, creation of policies and bylaws. It is absolutely critical that we do not create confusion and focus on the facts instead of speculation and learn from our experience and experiences from other jurisdictions and countries to improve the overall health and well-being of our community. One last thing I want to address is the letters that I'm receiving from various advocacy group regarding temporary foreign workers. First of all, I want to, to say this openly, that I'm not a politician I do not, and I do not work for any individual or any interest group or any agencies. I work for my community and my priority and my focus is on the health and well-being of everyone who live in Windsor and Essex County. Any concerns that we have heard regarding food and living condition of these temporary foreign workers are being addressed through the appropriate channel to resolve the issue instead of making it a political issue. The health and well-being of anyone who lives in Windsor, Essex will continue to be the top priority of, of Windsor, Essex County Health Unit. Thank you. The conference is now unmuted. We'll now take questions from the media. We'll start with the Windsor Star. Are you receiving a lot of uh, letters from different advocacy groups, Doctor? Um, I have received few, uh, and uh, uh, in, uh, some of these letters are very demanding. And I, as I said, I do not work for any individual or any agencies. 
I want to address the issue that is important for my community, and uh, I'm, I'm addressing those issues openly every day in front of everyone else, and uh, they should get the answers. I, 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 I do not like those uh, personal requests that I must do this or I must do that. So here I am, and I'm answering all the questions that the community is looking for. That's everything for now. Thank you. Any questions from CTV? Wow, Doc. Uh, well, okay, I, I guess I'll go there. Section 22 order, I'll bring it up again. So um, what I've been told, or what I've been, yeah, I guess what I've been told is that the, the request for you, I don't know if that's one of the requests you're talking about, is to uh, match uh, what uh, Middlesex Elgin is doing too with, uh, you know, in regards to feeding workers and, and their safety with PPE. So I don't know, is that your jurisdiction or is that something that has to come to, uh, through the province to be able to elevate and perhaps match what that health unit is doing? So Bob, I think I addressed that last time as well, that uh, even if uh, <clears throat> people are not aware of, um, our health unit was the first one to come out with the Section 22 class action order. And the ministry basically used our order to, uh, to uh, advise the other health units with the, with the farms to use our uh, section order as a template to create their own orders. Many of the things that you are seeing in the order uh, in other jurisdiction, it's already covered in our, uh, uh, in our section order. Some of these requirements are uh, as, as something that the, the employers are mandated to provide anyway, irrespective of whether it is in the order or not. It is under their occupational health and safety, and the Ministry of Labor is already following up on all those measures. So this is not something that, uh, uh, that if it's in the order, that's only it will then be followed up. The Ministry, is already, the Ministry of Labor is already on top of it and are issuing citation and uh, tickets if the employers are not following that. So we need to recognize that, yeah, I can put like the whole, uh, every guidance, every recommendation that we have for COVID-19 in an order. Uh, but we also need to recognize that, uh, you know, what is uh, covered and what's not covered. Our section order covers everything. If there are any violation, any concerns, whether we're talking about the mask, whether we are talking about some of the other things, it's already there and we are enforcing it. And the Ministry of Labor and the other, minis uh, and other ministries that have jurisdictions, they are using our order and they're also using what their guidance is to do the enforcement. So I think it's, it's again, going back to it's more of a political issue that uh, some individuals are trying to raise uh, just to be out there. It's unfortunate, but our order covers all of that. And if it's, uh, if it's something that we feel that it's important for the safety and well-being of the workers, and if it's important for the preventing the spread of the disease, our order will cover that because that will be public health jurisdiction and that will be something that we would want to cover to prevent the spread in the in that population. Okay, that's great. Thanks for that, Doc. And uh, also, uh, half of Ontario's new cases involve people 39 and younger. And I heard you on uh, AM800 this morning talking about how if you break down the numbers, half of our numbers involve uh, the youth between 20 and 40. So the youth, like I'm old or something. But um, why do you suppose that is? Well, I think that's a that's a broader question, and some of that goes to the uh, to the behavior of uh, of these younger people, uh, and um, and some of the misinformation that's out there. I think uh, that's what uh, we have been trying to 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 present all that fact instead of speculation, that there are people younger people who are in ICU. There are younger people who have died as a result of COVID nineteen, and there are a number of young people who are contracting COVID nineteen and. Uh, with what we are seeing with these reopening, more and more opportunities for everyone to lose their guards and to uh, to congregate in number um, and um, um, uh, not following the 10 uh, rule or uh, getting to a places where more and more parties are happening. Uh, and this trend is, uh, is not only in Windsor Essex, but it, I think it's across the province and across the country as well. So it is a concern that uh, people need to understand that uh, when you are not following the public health guidance, you are as equally as susceptible to contracting the virus and you are as equally susceptible to developing some of the severe complication. And God forbid, God forbid if, it's, if it's ended up in you, 
in the ICU or in the hospital are even worse. And that that would be really unfortunate for our community, and we need to recognize that that it is everyone's responsibility, whether we are young, middle-aged, or older. It's everyone's responsibility to do our part in preventing and reducing the spread of COVID-19. So we definitely want to address that uh, that uh, younger uh, people or younger age group that uh, majority of the cases are happening in that particular age group. So it is important that we follow all those public health measures to protect ourselves and protect uh, our loved ones and our community. Great. Thanks, Doc. Appreciate it. Any questions from, from CDC? Yes, please. Good morning, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, Ontario Health says they've tested about 19 farms as part of the on-site testing that they were doing. Um, on July 6th, they told us they had five more scheduled. And then this week, they said that they haven't tested any additional farms in the last two weeks. Um, they said that they are altered their approach uh, to accommodate other factors. What What is the status of on-farm testing. We have about 176 farms. Can you update us on what that approach might be? So right now, uh, a lot of those conversations are happening, and the majority of the, the changes in the strategy uh, stemmed from uh, one of the largest outbreak in the, in the farm in our region that required uh, isolation of uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, their workers in, in hotel room and the logistics of ensuring that uh, the public health needs are met and also from an accommodation and the food and other logistics that is needed uh, is there um, uh, for the for the for the testing and as we continue to report every day uh, about the cases in these farm workers that that uh, is telling on its own that the work of public health continues despite all of those surveillance testing the work of public health is continuing and it's ongoing and we are working with a number of farms um, we are following uh, their cases and contacts and ensuring that they are safely isolated and the spread is not happening. Uh, we are aware that uh, there will be additional testing that uh, happening this week as well as the next week and that process is restarting and uh, it would be a combination of on-site testing as well as testing that was uh, initially uh, started by the Erie Shores Healthcare. So some of those details are currently being worked at right now, uh, but we are aware that there are testing happening this week as well as next week. Thank you. And um, the province, uh, looking ahead to school starting in September, um, it's come to our understanding that uh, schools have to have individual plans for safety protocols and busing students uh, similar, we'll have to have um, safety protocols that the boards agree with, and the health unit is expected to review those plans. Is there any update there about where back to school safety stands? Uh, it's a good question, and I think that's one of the other things that uh, I'm glad that you mentioned it, that uh, your health unit is already engaged with, and this is not the new conversation. We have been working with many, many sectors to provide them with public health guidance. Uh, more recently, our team, including myself, uh, Teresa, and uh, our directors, are in constant uh, contact with the health board, uh, sorry, school boards, uh, as well as many other institutions, uh, St. Clair College, University of Windsor, um, other uh, other um, uh, agencies that uh, serve different uh, population. So we are constantly reviewing their plans and going into the very detailed uh, review of the plan, providing them with our recommendations and guidelines. So in addition to everything that else we are doing, this is also something that our team is taking it very seriously, and we are uh, supporting all the school boards in developing their plan. Uh, the bottom line is the plan is of the school board and uh, so they are the one to develop the plan. What we are doing is we are providing our recommendations to ensure that their plan is not putting anyone at, uh, at, at any risk. So we are doing that kind of review with the school board and then uh, some of those conversation is resulting in tweaking of their plans and, um, and uh, so that work is ongoing and um, um, to my understanding uh, the school boards are expected to submit their plan early in August based on the consultation with public health. So uh, we, we are working with them to finalize their plan at this point. Some of these conversations already happened, uh, but they are in the finalization stage right now. Thank you.
Any questions from Blackburn? Yes, Doctor, you talked a lot about uh, misinformation today and myths that are kind of out in the community. What are you hearing that is the, the most dangerous for people, do you think? What's the most harmful myth that you would like to maybe uh, dispel? So one of the most interesting, if I can be very frank, is uh, the the importance of public health measures and the role that public health unit is playing in the community. Um, it is unfortunate then uh, when uh, some uh, some 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 I guess strong voices. Let's just put it this way: some strong voices. If they are uh, they are questioning the data, they're questioning the measures, they're questioning the actions of public health. It definitely creates doubt in everyone's mind that whether our recommendation is based on evidence and whether our recommendation would be helpful in preventing these spread. And that's the one most dangerous thing that I'm concerned about. And I think uh, uh, some of the increases or some of the changes in the behavior, I, I cannot say if it was a result of the misinformation and some of the strong voices that was out there and, uh, and more recently and questioning uh, everything that we are doing. and. Uh, our staff, our data, our work has always been facts and evidence-based instead of any speculation, and we will continue to do that. And I think it's it's unfortunate that we have to experience some of those uh, uh, those uh, uh, messages. And uh, we try our best to ensure that uh, the right message is out there and uh, people are following those measures because any lapse and any question in any of the recommendation that we are making it creates doubt in mind, and it just takes us away from the real work of public health, and uh, it creates the spread. So I would really want to be very careful and very clear in public health messaging and the importance of it, and we need to follow those measures, and we need to understand that all of these measures and all of these recommendations are, that, are, that we are providing are based on evidence and not on speculations. Uh, and last thing when we did the epidemiological study, we held that there were very few hospital cases. Now we've jumped to 15. Is that just a reflection of the increase of cases that we've seen in the community over the last four or five days? Um, I was having a hard time understanding you, Maureen, but if I understood you correctly, are you saying that the number of hospitalized cases were going down and now we have eight cases? And if this is a concern, is that your question? Yeah, so no, uh, absolutely. And I think that's uh, that's what we are seeing with uh, some of the community cases. And uh, uh, right now, uh, some of them are younger people as well. So we want to make sure that, uh, you know, the message is out there that uh, uh, there could be uh, many reasons for people to, um, uh, to, 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 get hospitalized and to end up in in ICU. So we, we definitely are concerned about that and uh, we want to make sure that, um, you know, those uh, people shouldn't lose their guard and they should continue to practice uh, the all the public health measures. Any questions from Amy Hunter? Just a follow up to Maureen's question, Dr. Ahmed, when you say uh, younger age group in hospital can you give us an age bracket on uh, that age group that is in hospital right now um at this point i may not be able to provide that information but uh i will uh i, I will present that data two days from now on friday uh maybe i can touch on that okay can you say if there is any young people in the icu right now I, I think the hospital would, uh, would provide that information. And again, I, I don't want to uh, speculate anything, but to my, uh, what I heard, not from a credible source uh, that I can count on, uh, that there is uh, a, a younger uh, person in the ICU as well. But I would, I, would, uh, I would suggest that, confirm that with the hospital. Okay. Any, oops, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I'll just do my last one right now, if you don't mind. And then um, I guess community spread. You touched on this on Friday, how you're concerned. The number of community spread keeps on going up. Obviously, agri-food is important. Uh, all Anyone that has the virus, at the end of the day, it's always concerning. But with the community spread going up almost daily, what, what do you think the factors are there? We have the masks in place. Do you think people are just not following the the social distancing measures and other measures that have been put in place? 
Yeah, I think that's 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 what the understanding is, and even if from a social circle perspective, uh, I think uh, I can speak personally to my experience as well. That we know that there are people who are now uh, gathering and uh, having those social gatherings uh, with uh, with large number of people, um, and that's that's something that I think we may need to uh, be concerned about. And uh, in addition, I think overall, just the uh, just more reason, more opportunity for people to congregate whether we are talking about the workplaces, whether we are talking about uh, 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 bars and restaurants and, uh, and malls and any of the other places. So I think it, it is out there. We need to work with that assumption that anyone that you are interacting with could be a potential case of COVID and uh, ensure that all those measures are in place to, uh, to protect yourself uh, when you're interacting with anyone in the community. Thank you. Any further questions from the Windsor Star? No, thanks, Mike. CTV? I'm guessing this might be uh, deferred to the hospital, but uh, out of the 15 that are in hospital, uh, how many are ventilators? Would you know, or is that a hospital question? That would be a hospital question, Bob. Okay, I'll, I'll reach out to them then. Thanks, Doc. Thank you. Any further questions from CBC? No, thank you. Blackburn? No, thanks. AM800? No, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.